All right. Well, I'm here with Martin Shaw. Martin, it's a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. I've been reading your book, Courting the Wild Twin, and I stayed up really late last night. It just pulled me in, and I absolutely love it. It's, uh, it's having a real visceral effect on me. And in the book, you tell the story of the lindworm. It's an old fairy tale. And I've heard this story told many times by different tellers. But for some reason, this time, it's really hitting me. Like it's, it's resonating so deeply with me. And I don't know if that's because of where I'm at. Uh, you know, 13 years into a marriage, it speaks to some of the themes that I've gone through over the course of this time, uh, or if it's the way that you tell it. And I think it's probably a combination of both. I just really appreciate the way that you unfold the story and um, always inviting us to, to feel it in our bodies, really, instead of making the usual first move of interpreting and uh, talking about what the images represent in the story. Your first move is to imagine what it's like to be the serpent in the story, for instance, or to be the shepherd's daughter. And I really, really appreciate that. And so it's a great pleasure to have you here. And I'm excited to see where this conversation takes us. Anything to say about, uh, you know, my reflection on the book so far? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Brian. Um, it, it's it's a common thought amongst storytellers that you're dealing with wild animals when you're working with a story and there's something degrading about immediately telling it what it is so there needs to be a kind of spaciousness in which you trail the story but you don't trap it and i've got that wrong on plenty of occasions but it is one of those things that you learn from experience. Otherwise, the thing quickly becomes a pamphlet or a mission statement or a stuffed bird. And it's got no wings. It's got no energy. And so I think courting the wild twin especially, I had been literally and metaphorically around the world with that story in my jaw before I ever wrote it down. So it had a kind of oral currency to it. Um, someone that I worked with a little bit at the end of his life and many of the other people you would have spoken to, I'm sure are fans of, was the psychologist James Hillman. Mm. And Hillman always said, the way into a story is felt experience. It's not just ornament, ornamental language. It's not just um, a set of symbols. It's like an acupuncture point or even a blow to the face. You know, it's a felt experience. Yeah, or punch now, in the gut. Yeah, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to stay there forever. You know, uh, a culture with a mythic sensibility then educates and refines that seal hole or that entry point into the story. But rather than worrying initially about, do I understand this story from beginning to end as if, what does understanding really mean? What I am clear about is apprehending one or two moments in whom's presence your heart first opens, to quote Camus. So um, Wild Twin has a, has a heritage behind it of, of course, um, the Sicilian storyteller Gioia Timpanelli, uh, my old uh, boss, really, Robert Bly, people like that. And so I was overtly trying to continue that tradition. It's a bit like a blues musician playing a few licks that, you know, that you're, you're trying to honor Howling Wolf or Muddy Waters as you're doing it. Yeah. But you're also bringing in your own personality and your own insights. And in the second half of Courting the Wild Twin, you're just into my world then. You're into mm -hmm. how I'm thinking and responding. But but it's also a love letter to the ones that stand behind me. And in storytelling and myth, that's sort of important that you acknowledge the ones that galvanized and energized you. You don't lose credibility by naming influence. 
you know, I'm glad you spoke to that because that's one of the things that I really appreciate you appreciate about you is that you do acknowledge uh, some of the people that you've learned from and who have inspired you. And sometimes I don't hear that. And so in the book, you you mentioned Robert Bly quite a few times, and there's something in the way that you unfold the story and bring it home uh, to the reader or invite them to bring it home to themselves. Uh, that reminds me of Bly, you know, sometimes when he'd tell a story or read a poem, he would repeat a line or a section and he would pause and he would just say, do you feel that? Did you feel that? Like, you know, I felt it. Did you guys feel it too? Oh yeah. Yes. And, and that is an overt influence, not an unconscious one. That is because I, because I, I, I've earned the right to do it. I, I talk with Robert a lot. Uh, I was really the last guy through the door to know him fairly well, hmm. not as well as others. Uh, John Lee knows him much better. But no, I, it was a way of being in the world, a way of being with stories, being with poems that felt I recognized it in the echolocation and the animalness of my body as I was in the presence of a great teacher. And I was happy to inherit some of that very effective way of working but it's not pastiche either it's a it's this this thing you learn over time where you become utterly yourself but when you really are utterly yourself you can draw on a great influence like Bly without mimicking or ripping him off yeah and maybe the way i think about it is that we're drawn to those teachers or storytellers because it's resonating with with the acorn inside of us you know the seedling inside of us and so when we start to maybe sound like them as we come into our own it's merely a reflection of what uh what they drew out of us that was already present you know yes i think so and i think you can indulge that for a while but speaking as someone, I currently have well over a thousand students. And one of the things that I do look for is, are they, because you know, after a while, you notice a lot of the guys have suddenly got beards and they're wearing hats <laughs> and they've got nice <laughs> calves and they're, they're looking a bit like me and the stories they're digging into are stories that I tell. And that, that serves them for a while and it provides a kind of comfort to feel that you're in the shelter of a big tree, like a Bly or a Hillman or a Maladoma or a Prechtel, but you really, in the end, have to settle into the authenticity of your own incompleteness. You really do. And so in other words, it's the difference between apprenticeship and mastery. The mm. apprenticeship is fine to do that, especially if it's done in a loving and a kind of conscious manner. But then there does come a point, and I'm long past that in my own work, where you finally get from persona into presence. You really get down into the knuckle and the dirt of, of what you're actually about. And I hope I carry some of the perfume of my old teachers for the rest of my life. But the place I'm now going with it is the place I have to go. Yeah. Um, do you think there's something to it about being an apprentice to that potential inside of you, like what James Hillman would maybe call the oak tree that's in the acorn inside of you? I do. I do. I recently um, went through the ardor of a um, 101 day pilgrimage where I went into a forest uh, for 101 days, it was a secret vigil. No one really knew about it. But I went in to listen to whatever it was the forest had to disclose to me. I'm 25 years into being a wilderness rites of passage guide. I have spent countless thousands of hours alone in wild places. But I wanted to do it as a form of praise making and gift making to the place. Now, I got nine words as my reward for that 101 days really odd and, and it's a sentence i'll be puzzling about for the rest of my life the nine words i got at the end were inhabit the time and genesis of your original home inhabit the time and genesis of your original home 
there's enough bumps in that sentence for it not to be easy. It's not, <laughs> yeah. a, not a it's not a sound bite. It's not a hashtag. It's odd because we kind of know that there's something important in it, but we can't quite get to it. Uh, it's got roughage in it. And so for the last year, it's about a year since I did that, I've been trying to get in touch with my utter naturalness, which is not apprenticeship. If it's a, it's just apprenticeship to what was always there. Yeah, yeah. It, that thing, when you talk about Hillman, you're kind of rubbing up against the, end, the edge of the notion of the daimon. Mm -hmm. That actually, something I say over and over again, and other people do too, that our lives, it's not about you can be anything you can. It's actually that probably way back in the in the dream, the dreaming of things, you had a contract to be something quite specific. But the moment you get here, pop, you're not <laughs> over the head, you fall into the milky amnesia and you have to claw your way towards a kind of remembering and sometimes you apprentice to others for a long time but in the end you're trying to get to this for me a kind of naturalness or what i'm now calling in my own work beautiful learning mm. and beautiful learning i know i've had a school now for 18 years and i know my school is successful because it's full of people that are as varied as there are weather patterns it's as varied as there are animals in other words although there may be some affection and respect for what their teacher does i love myself at the core of the thing they're getting to grips with their own uh, their own acorn their own embryonic mischief yeah, that's great. I, I get the image of kind of um, cultivating a forest rather than a stand of birches or something, you know, like producing a bunch of Martin Shaw juniors with the vest and the hat and the beard. <laughs> it's hard. It is hard. Uh, I, and I know that that sometimes, especially with with male students, they have to kind of consciously break away for a few years because of that. And I always understood that. Here's a, a story years and years and years ago in the 20th century, a very young Dutch painter, the great Willem de Kooning, arrived in New York and was immediately offered a job. And they said, you can work in the studio of Arshil Gorky. It was a big deal. You'd learn a lot from Arshil Gorky. But de Kooning wouldn't do it because he said, nothing grows under big trees. Mm. <laughs> However, I would argue it depends on the tree. Yeah. And I think if you are, uh, if you're lucky enough to be in the presence of someone who is, you know, gracious and tough and is really has your best interests at heart, in other words, that very rare thing called an elder, then you would be advised to take it. But part of the job of an elder is they also know to then create the circumstances in which you leave. Yeah. And that's the problem with the cults and the ashrams and the rest of it. The leaving device is not always so healthy because really what is going on is um, we are looking for, we're looking to fix all sorts of parental snarls up, snarl ups that happened when we were kids. So yeah, there, it, 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 it is an interesting thing. And as I am lucky enough, I, I exist in this Hermean hinge place mm -hmm. where I'm, I've always been in the last 15 years, predominantly known as a sort of a wilderness teacher and a storyteller and mythologist. But just now in lockdown, and I know this through the amount of books I've sold, I'm now known as a writer. Mm. I've kind of I'm on this hinge between orality and literacy. It's, it's an interesting place for me. Um, but um, anyway, I've lost my thread. Carry on, Brian. <laughs> oh, I appreciate all of that. And, you I know, just had just had the, the vaccine. Oh, so you're feeling a little foggy or <laughs> I, I, I'm yeah, uh, I notice certain thoughts are coming out of me and I, I can't quite get to the end of them. So forgive me, but it could be interesting. 
you know? yeah yeah well uh, that's a very like interesting point you brought up about um that moment between teacher and apprentice that happens and often it happens in a not so healthy way because because of unconsciousness on the teacher's part or unconsciousness on the student's part or usually both um, and i've experienced that in my own life with teachers where uh i've kind of like had to make a maybe a, a violent kind of break or something like something in me just starts to reject them or starts to project things onto them and I, I can see looking back that that served my own growth like having to follow my own path but I always wondered if there was um, better ways to negotiate that kind of uh, that separation. Um, but I don't really, I don't hear many people talking about that, like what it's like to be a teacher or a guide and have people who look up to you and project uh, your father figure onto you or wise elder, whatever. Well, let's let's talk about Bly. Let's do, because he's you know he's in the room already. I had the experience. Um, of working with Bly, but the, the huge difference is that I was all grown up by the time I met the guy. I was into my 30s. I was a young father. I'd had a hell of a life by the time I met him. And I had a functioning dad who I still talk to and love. So mm -hmm. I didn't need another one. Uh, Bly was brilliant and is brilliant, but he's also a pugilist. And the word pugilist, if you, you know, boxer, he's a fighter. So if you can't scrap publicly, this is not the ground for you. Mi mixed martial arts is as for nothing as for going out on stage with Robert, because he'll take it anywhere he wants to go. And that is part of the electricity of it. And it's part of the unpredictability of working with him. Now, I'm pleased to say that didn't go sour mm. with me. There, there was no falling out, A, because I view him as a sort of Blakeian genius, and I don't ever think of myself in that kind of way. Um, I just loved him. And one of the things you learn as you get older is, especially, I, I can only really speak of this in the, probably in the masculine way, you, a lot of men want to be the, the top of the tree. They want to be the leader. They want to be the chief. They want respect. And the irony is, that is a lonely gig. And I know that mm -hmm. now. I didn't know it when I was younger, but I know it now. And so actually, when finally your, your mentors are out of the picture, you're doing the work, you're producing the content, you're writing the books, everyone's coming to see you. It is not half as much fun as when there was an upper flank of elders who were batting you around the head, getting you to go and get the water for the sweat lodge, make sure the rocks were hot enough, all of that. That is a, a phase that shouldn't be hurried because it's precious. Mm. But most men are so desperate to get to that point where they feel they've earned their stripes. But I promise you, it's overrated. Oh yeah, I feel that, yeah. That, <laughs> that magic time when you're just one in the crowd. Um, I love that. And I love hearing about that combativeness with uh, Bly because we have little, um, we have like little samples of him speaking live to a group, mostly audio, and it's mostly been edited. So we don't get a lot of that back and forth. But in some of the recordings from the men's conference in Minnesota, you do hear some of that. And especially when there's like the Mount Rushmore of the men's movement up there, like Mead, Hillman and Bly, and to hear the you know, Bly will be in the audience while Hillman's speaking and he'll be shouting things out and calling them on stuff. It's great. Yeah, yeah. And Bly would, Bly encouraged them. If Bly was bored and you were on stage with, say, uh, a vase of flowers, he'd just start eating the flowers. Or, he, <laughs> or I was once interviewing him. We were actually, we were just having a conversation and he grabbed the vase of flowers and threw all the water at me. It's that kind of thing. It's just, he's just fucking bored. <laughs> and if he's bored, he's he's very interesting, Bly. I, I've often reflected on the fact that, that there was a lot of the punk rocker in him. Mm. Odd, you know, because he's so refined and you know, I, I I I could I could I really could deliver a lecture on on the trouble and beauty of of Bly. But um yeah, it was a it was a what the I'll be interested in this current renaissance mm -hmm. of men's work. There isn't, there is not a Bly. There is not the 
and there is not a Hillman. Or a Prechtel or a Maladoma. Oh, I mean, yeah, you get into, you get in, Martin Prechtel is a genius 20 times over. Maladoma brought an enormous amount of information with him. One of the most effective teachers I ever saw in men's work is still around, who's John Lee. Yeah. You know, John Lee gets straight to the heart of the trouble very quickly. But if it's going to be more than just outpourings of grief, sweat lodges and sh- share you know sharing circles there has to be content there has to be content and by the time i arrived in the men's work that was not as apparent that you know the the three those three guys were not working together particularly anymore they were all doing amazing stuff on their own but i I like to chew on something i like a good sermon you know Mm -hmm. and um i've said this before but for your readers, I, I really want to say something about Michael Mead for a second, because by the time those three guys got together, Bly had won the National Book Award. Hillman had written, <laughs> written in psychology. Yeah. These are two of the most significant cultural firebrands in America in the late 20th century. And in the middle of them, a complete unknown turns up. Mm-hmm. And and doesn't just hold his own, but is is that third dynamic that makes the thing explode in the way that it does. I remember being at a dinner party uh, in the 90s and a guy saying to me, he said, oh, you know, he said, you know, do, what do you think of the men's work? And I said, oh, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not attracted to it. It feels anything that feels like a kind of a secret society of weeping bearded men <laughs> isn't a great isn't a great sell for me but he said i've got these tapes and it was it was mead initially that i heard and of course i've been a professional drummer for many years mm. so he's a great great player but actually mead had a a, a a a strength to him he had a he had great poetic insight that that thing the men's work, no doubt about it, even though a lot of the groups were leaderless, it constellated around major talent. Yeah, well, Mead, I mean, he brought a real a real authenticity to that work because he grew up on the streets. He was working on the front lines with uh, young gang members. Like he really was putting himself out there for a long time before he hit the scene. He did, and of course, you know, Mead, his exemplary work with Mosaic, uh, you know, Mead went to tough places and stayed there. Mead could have lived, you know, uh, in Marin County for the rest of his life very comfortably, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. He went, and and all of the men's work guys in the mid-90s got the memo early about diversity. They did, you know, they knew that a hundred Norwegians uh, up in Minnesota year after year after year was useful for them, but they wanted to do more than that. And so that was always part of the mix. So when really you've named them, the men's work really deepened when Maladoma and Martin, totally different characters, came and started to bring big, difficult rituals. My friend Miguel Rivera, who was there through the whole thing, said the problem is we spend five days talking and five minutes praying mm, and we need yeah. to spend five days praying and five mm. minutes. yeah and that that kind of sums up where um you know where my issues with the kind of current renaissance as it's being called of the men's movement is is uh everything that you've said along the way here that i don't really see any new content uh, they're still studying Iron John and King Warrior Magician Lover. And a lot of that stuff hasn't aged very well in my books. Um, you know, I keep pointing people when I see things come up about Iron John, I keep saying, hey, have you read Bly's later book, Sibling Society? Because yeah. that's a lot of what's going on with the men's movement. It's a lot of young men mentoring other young men. And I keep asking like, or I keep waiting maybe for the elders to show up to the the great um, the preachers to show up for the real shaman to show up, you know, and to really spark something because otherwise, yeah, it feels like 
it, just the picture that you painted, a lot of guys uh, kind of demonstrably emoting and hugging and then wrestling. Uh, and I don't see the poetry or the, the leadership there. No, um, you're right. You're right. Now, I, of course, as I'm saying this, there'll be guys listening to this, throwing things across the room saying, hey, you haven't met me yet, buddy. And I say, bless you, sir. And I, I mean, I, you know, so there's a lot happening that I just probably don't know about. But content is content. And, you know, you another thing I've got to throw in the mix, you know, Robert doesn't write Iron John till he's 65. Yeah. You know, Mead was probably in his mid 40s. Hillman would have also been in his 60s. These are older guys, you know, carrying their damage effectively but all three of them were lethal tough boys i promise you this is these are not these are not soft characters um now okay so i'm in the midst of all of this and i recognize that my vocation although it's mythopoetic i'm forged in a different climate i actually come maladoma once said for me said in a way you come from an indigenous culture mm. because you come from you know, the far west of Britain, your family have been there forever. You're completely tied up with stories of place. So in other words, my totemic figures in landscape, in poetry and in story were already formed and intact before I went into that. In other words, it wasn't the men's work that did the alchemy on it. I was already, I was already tuned you know, as, as Seamus Heaney says, we need to tune our ear. Hmm. But I just arrived and thought it was really, you know, really interesting. Uh, but I, I'm glad, I'm glad that, that there are people, you know, trying, you know, feeling that men are always going to want to gather. Women are always going to want to gather. Wherever you are on the spectrum of gender, there's something about going to the woods. It's, it, you know what it is? It's like a really beautiful, deep version of um, Dead Poet Society. Mm. You know, it's like, wow, yeah, let's go to the woods with our land. I'll always support that because I am a romantic and myth of the myth of poetic tradition long before Blind Hillman. It was people like C.S. Lewis. It was Tolkien. It was the romantics. It is everything that is good and right about the Western tradition. That, that is terribly complex at the moment because people associate it with, uh, you know, anything European is colonial. Yeah. So it, it's an incredibly volatile and complex situation. So I don't want to, I don't want to damn for a second the revival of men's work, but you won't get the real teachers, I don't think, coming back because it's already so familiar to them. Mm. It's like, you know, do you really want to go back and start courting the girl that you loved when you were 27? No, you don't. You know, you've been there. You've got the T-shirt. You want to do something else. And so I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, but listen, I, I still listen to grunge music all the time and love it. <laughs> well, may maybe so, Brian. And, and I, you know, I, I hope you and your Screaming Trees CDs, you know, go on forever. <laughs> But I, I tell you what, personally, I don't. I'm not interested in it because um, my relationship to myth, the, the problem with myth is now we, we associate it almost entirely with gender exploration. And that's because of Clarissa Pincola Estes and her marvelous book, Women That Run With Wolves on one hand, Iron John on the other. But I, I think men and women have said plenty to each other in the last couple of decades. Could we please pay attention to our relationship with the fucking earth? Mm. The reason I'm involved in this is not to keep some <laughs> thread going from something that happened 35 years ago. Mm. I'm interested because it seems to me from my very earliest childhood, I've been aware that the earth seems to think in myth. The way people, indigenous or otherwise, communicate back and forward with it most effectively is through story. When human beings imagine, we imagine in story. And so I, in my own work, I veer away from stuff that's, you know, predominantly about exploration of the masculine or the feminine soul or anywhere else, because 
my work has been wilderness rites of passage, not ceremonies at conferences with lots and lots of people, mm. but four or five of you out on a hill without food for four days and nights up in uh, the wilds of Snowdonia. So I just, I'm not saying it's better, it's just different. And that's my particular field of experience and interest. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think too, like for me, um, when we're relating on the level of soul, it's beyond gender. And so it's more about uh, human relatedness with each other for certain, but also, yeah, with, uh, with mythology and with nature. I hear that. Now, you mentioned, um, you know, you touched on Maladoma saying that, you know, you're recognizing that you're indigenous to Europe. And over here in, in North America, we often forget that that's still a possibility is that there are indigenous European people out there. And I'm wondering, like, from your perspective, having been in the US and, you know, with all these students from all over the world, do you think that us uh, displaced Europeans face a particular set of challenges in relating to the place where we now find ourselves and um, finding a sense of belonging where we are? Yes, I do. I do think you face an extraordinary set of challenges. Uh, I, just for a second, though, I would say it the, touching, though it was that Maladoma said that, I would probably, because of what the word now signifies, I wouldn't use the word indigenous. I just wouldn't use it. Uh, I, I'm quite fine with, you know, <laughs> it comes from Devon. That's enough. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, to, that could be seen as manipulative in some way. But uh, yeah, okay, so let's look at America. Let's look at Turtle Island. From my perspective, which is as an Anglo-Irish guy, whose family have always sort of been in this, this general area. When you sailed from Plymouth, which is almost within walking distance of where I'm talking to you, mm. mythically, you sailed into the West, which is the place of the other world, and it's where we go to bury our dead. It's also a place where we go to, for heroes to be possibly revived, but it's not necessarily a place to live in. Mm. There you are. Here you all are. There's millions of you. And my brother lives in America and I teach in America. But I will say that from the very first visit to, to now, whenever I'm in America, grand, mysterious, beautiful, conflicted as it is, uh, in my skin, I'm aware I'm in a kind of other world. Mm. And that makes me restless. There's always a restlessness for me when I'm in America. And so, yes, if you're, I think, and I'm, I'm still on the question, any myths that are going to feel compelling and real in the next 50 years are going to have to involve the issue of migration and travel because that's so much part of everybody's story. A lot of the students that I have in the States, very rarely, they very rarely now live where they grew up or their parents came from somewhere else. And I think rather than that, rather than indulging in too much neurosis about that, because I see that constantly, this desire that we somehow, do you remember I said earlier on, in our incompleteness is our authenticity. Mm -hmm. I don't think some big indigenous style, st style ritual squeezed into white people long past the age when it would have had any potency is that credible. Mm -hmm. I just don't. And, and I, I really do speak from some experience. This is a man that lived in a tent for four years, you know. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be reaching out and learning as much wisdom as we possibly can. But what I'm trying to get at is whatever your pigment, whatever your ethnicity, the first step, the real step, I would suggest is to pay attention to the ground that you actually stand upon at this moment in your life. Look at the relationships the mistakes, 
look at the place you're currently living in, look at the places you've lived before, look at the ancestral connections that you may have. Probably don't pay too much attention to your parents, but think about great, great grandparents. In other words, underneath your knees is this little prayer mat. And the problem is most of us are so arrogant, we've forgotten how to kneel down. Mm -hmm. And we're looking to space like Elon Musk and we're looking in the wrong direction. The, can, the problems of the Earth are not going to be solved by Mars or us going to Mars. The problem is we are constantly in the we're in the West. We are possessed with our capacity and our desire to devour. But actually, what I do with all my students is just say, "Listen, there's this little prayer mat that you're kneeling on that you're not attending to. It's called the conditions of your life." You don't need to change your name necessarily. You don't necessarily need to gobble a visionary vegetable. You don't need to do any of that stuff. In actual fact, what I'm asking for is you pay attention to small things mm. and really get to grips with the mythic ground you stand upon. And that is when myths and stories really kick in and really have a life-changing capacity. I've been, you know, let's make no mistake, what we've gone through in the last year is one of the biggest things I have ever seen in my life, you know, uh, the, the, the COVID thing, because it's, it's got a whisker, it's got a, a rumour of the initiatory about it, but it has none of the parameters, mm -hmm. boundaries and destination that an effective rite of passage has. But... Does it throw us into the liminal? Kind of. It throws us into great uncertainty. But that word liminal has another word attached to it that people never use. Although Victor Turner, the anthropologist, came up with both liminoid. Mm -hmm. Liminoid is when you have the encounter, but none of the wisdom. Yeah. You have, you have the, the rupture, but you don't have the rapture. And it is entirely... To see, to see what, what is going to come from this. But what I do know through the conversations that I do finally get to have in my uh, cottage is a lot of people looking for a deeper life. And I would predict, uh, I would predict that religion will get picked up again by a few people. Mm. Uh, spiritual quests one way or another, just a sense of actually not necessarily returning to business as usual mm -hmm. i have to say over the past year i've really been stressing that to people i've been talking about to you about just paying attention to what's happening in the here and now where you are and i think people of course are more open to that and i think at a certain point you know everyone's getting zoom fatigue and so what's your next option is to really start paying attention to like i love that how you said the prayer mat is under your knees or under your feet at any given moment and if you're standing on your prayer mat you better get down and start kneeling <laughs> even that's maybe it. maybe even touching your head to it that's it i yeah i i think a little humility would be would be good and i think all these men's group guys should not be on social media for a year they should stop they should stop with the apparel they should stop with the visuals they should just it's not convincing it looks like a photo session yeah fuck that you know get find it find an older guy in your community that knows how to strip a car or has a skill and go and learn a bit about skill <laughs> yeah uh, it's, anyway. it's no it's funny you say that there's a there's a guy across we're kind of out in the country we're about 30 kilometers outside of this small city of victoria um and on our road there's a guy across the street and i'm you know, I joke to my wife that he's like creating his own uh, Bollingen up there, like Carl Jung building his castle out of stone, but he's building a stone archway in his uh, front garden. And it's amazing to walk by every day and like have a little chat with him about where he's at, because he's just kind of like taken this on as a project on his own without any masonry skill or knowledge. He's figuring it out as he goes. And it's already fallen down once, and now it's back up. And he's out there every day working away at it. And uh, there's something that I find just 
like I'm overjoyed to see him take on this project as an older man when so many older men I know are, you know, down in the Baja of Mexico playing pickleball or just drinking beer all day, you know? So it's, it's inspiring to me to see a guy like this who's just out there doing a simple thing. He's not, um, he's not taking photos and putting it on Instagram. He's not doing it for anyone else, right? You know, you know my, fa my favorite part of what you just told me about him is that it keeps falling down. Yeah. <laughs> because if, you keep, if something keeps falling down, it means eventually you have to ask people to help you. And the whole thing becomes unsustainable. And I'm a big fan of things that are unsustainable. I think unsustainability is sexier than st stability. <laughs> because then, you know, you, 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 you're, you're figuring out stuff together. You see, that's what was so exciting, I think, for the early men's, the first love of the men's work stuff. They were figuring out as they went along. It hadn't become ever franchised. You know, Bly was far too an original a thinker. He was too mercurial. You know, Sibling Society is a book written long before its time. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to talk about one of my books for a second. Otherwise, <laughs> I feel because, because, because I feel something when if you're in the presence of a real human being, at some point you will hear their gratitude to the ones that came before. And if you don't hear it, you need to stay away from them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, after I wrote this little book, Courting the Wild Twin, that was very much um, a tribute to my teachers. And actually, between me and you, I thought it might be kind of the end of that kind of thing, because I'm, I'm an independently minded man myself. And I thought maybe I want to do something else, you know. Uh, but then lockdown got me back out in the woods running a vigil. And one evening I was looking at the participants waiting to go out and I was watching the curve of the smoke coming from the fire. And it just got me thinking about this old Siberian notion you see in myth where sometimes if you want to kill somebody or if you want to do something wicked, you have to close the smoke hole of your tent so God can't see you. God can't see the act. And I feel as a culture in the, the sedation of social media and the rest of it, for a lot of us, the smoke hole has closed and we don't even realize it because we're staring at a screen half a foot in front of us all the time. Mm -hmm. So this other book arrived in five days. <laughs> you know, Brian, books often take me five years. Wrote it in five days. Smoke hole. It's called Looking to the Wild in the Time of the Spyglass. And it's written for everyone. It's the one time I'll do this. It's just written for some guy working a double shift at McDonald's in Idaho. It's, it's, for, it's for a girl losing her mind over a doctorate in Birmingham, whatever you're doing. And it works with three ideas that for the last year, all we've heard is touch nothing touch nothing, touch nothing, and then wash your hands. So my question coming out of the story of the handless maiden is how on earth do we grow our hands back after an experience like that? So the first part of the book is that, growing our hands back. The second part of the book is called Breaking Enchantments because I realized in this most recent iteration of lockdown after Christmas, I was starting to withdraw deeply into myself in a way that I recognized was not spiritually helpful. It wasn't like being on the mountaintop. It wasn't like walking a river. I was just becoming a bit ill. Mm. And so I took the, I took the, the, I took the resources I needed just to have conversations again with other people. So the second chapter breaking enchantments is saying actually often the, the heaviest enchantments are things we're laying on ourselves. It's not something that anyone else does. Mm -hmm. So I look at that. We're growing our hands back. We're breaking enchantments. And thirdly, the third section is called kicking the robbers out of the house. And that is about my growing unease, uh, not, not just with technology, but particularly with the power of social media. I'm a father. 
I have a teenage daughter. Mm. So that's where this kind of attention is coming from for me. Um, the, the, you have an, every child these days has an angel and a demon in their pocket. You yeah. know, we are living in a time for the first time in my life where there's a generation coming where they're not interested in going on a gap year or traveling or seeing Africa or seeing uh, Aboriginal Australia or even going to New York and drinking in a bar that Jack Kerouac did because the real frontier now is in their pocket. Mm. And that is so weird and strange. The final question in the book really is when did when did a tool become a deity? Mm. Because I really do believe that we're all worshiping something, whether we know it or not. Oh yeah. But that's, that's my contribution to the war effort. You know, that's my contribution to, to, to where we are. Oh, amazing. Is that, um, is smoke hole out now? Is it available for any everyone? Minute, any minute. It'll, it'll be out. I think mid mid May. It's with uh, Chelsea Green, who have just an extraordinary publisher. I have to say, it's been a total delight to work with such a team. And um, yeah, if if you if you responded to courting the wild twin, then it's it's in that uh, um, maybe tone. Maybe it's the wild twin of the wild twin book. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I stand by it and I enjoy or it. The offspring of the wild twin, maybe. It is the but you know the bastard daughter. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure, but um, I'm I'm very interested in this moment that we're in. Uh, I'm beginning to teach again, you know, publicly uh, over the summer. We'll see how it goes, and I'm interested in what I call oral thought and culture making. And in our kind of circles, and I would suggest, Brian, we probably have lots of sort of people in common. When people hear culture making, they sort of gulp and don't quite know what it means or does it mean that they don't really know what it means. Culture making, I mean, the word culture comes from colère, which is associated with the word to dig. So I'm telling everybody, dig, mm. trade a little growth for some depth, find out what's on your prayer mat dare to assume that your life may have a dignity that you haven't quite found yet mm. and do the work because actually in the end i'm really glad at the moment people are finally becoming interested in the notion of storytelling well storytelling is about telling you know it's a kind of crooked way of telling the deepest truth that you can but you will appear unreal unless you found that prayer mat ground unless mm -hmm. you found the weather pattern you are, unless you found the animal that you are. Uh, as I said, you know, and this was something I'm sure Bly would have said, you know, you trade eventually, excruciatingly, you trade persona for presence. You know, you stop sounding like you've swallowed a thesaurus. <laughs> you, can, you know, you can set, settle down a bit into your own irascible nature and just see what happens. Yeah, this brings up something that um, I was thinking about on my walk this morning about storytelling and mythology and what we've kind of done with it. Like, it's almost like now when I look out and see people teaching about mythology or storytelling, it's always kind of... Keep going. I'm just opening the door window for my cat. Okay. <laughs> It's always kind of used as like a, uh, a teaching curriculum or some kind of uh, psychological model or something, you know, and it had me wondering, like, you know, was there a time like back in the olden days, would people just tell stories and not have to pick apart every detail and talk about what every element means? And have we like somehow ruined storytelling in making it academic and studying it? I mean, you're a scholar of mythology. This is your vocation is to study myth. Um, so just, I, I was just thinking about that. And I wonder if you have any insight into that. Is this always been the nature of storytelling to unpack it? Or was it always just, uh, I mean, was it different? We re we've always wrestled with stories, but wrestling isn't the same as unpacking. Wrestling is not the same as unpacking. Unpacking has a kind of a feeling like you're taking Noah's boat apart plank by plank 
and you're not going to be left with anything you can build or work with afterwards. No, it's a relatively recent um, situation. It's a kind of 20th century situation, really, and it's, its origins are sincere, but usually badly handled. And so suddenly um, the story has been eviscerated it's, it, it's something I always say to my students is you, when you come back from a fast, you walk back with a wild animal, not a pelt. Mm. A lot of storytellers are carrying pelts. Mm. And that's not good. It's not alive. It's not alive. And I, I say this, I really am not saying this like a, like a, a harangue. I'm just saying it to, to let you know what time it is. Uh, you're this storytelling in its traditional form or one of its storytelling can be as simple as okay we're walking to the next village we've got 10 miles god's sake tell me a, <laughs> tell me a, wild <laughs> tell me a tell, 10 mile story yeah that's completely that's completely legit but of course there are stories which are rituals in disguise and there are rituals that are stories in disguise and it all lives on the antler of the tongue and that's different those are the stories that are being used to, you know, educate in the word educate, to, to pull forth something. And that takes master practitioners. When I first started telling stories, the great thing about it was you only got a reputation through road miles. Only through road miles. You had to do it and 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 collapse and weep and do it again. You had to be away from your fan club. You had to be away from people that were cheering you on. You had to go into prisons. You had to work with youth in the most God awful of situations. You knew you worked with veterans coming back from situations you can barely imagine. In other words, you got vetted. You got thoroughly vetted. But now, if you can if you can build a flash website, you're a master storyteller. Mm. That's horseshit. It is utter horseshit. You earn those things, and you never say them about yourself. Right. Yeah. Seamus Heaney, the Seamus Heaney, could barely bring himself to call himself a poet, <laughs> because he said that is a praise name, and that is for other people to say. Yeah, I think a bit of that. That's that's how you get good <laughs> road miles. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and it's, uh, it's probably some bitter medicine for people out there who are marketing themselves pretty slickly as you know troubadours or storytellers or something. But I, I feel you, man, and uh, that's a long road, and a lot of people aren't willing to put in the miles. No, no, well, we're we're not we're not that's not the mandate of the day now it's you should have it and you should have it quick but the goddess of limits says this you know here's here's the thing oral storytelling has very rarely been monetized in other words you very rarely are living out of it and most of the really compelling storytellers for me are not showboats they're not people designed to magnetize a room of a thousand people. I mean, that's what I like doing, but, 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 you know, that's been my own particular thing. What I've seen is the most compelling storytelling can happen when there's three or four family members around a fire or in a different location. And so what I'd urge anybody that's interested, I would want to say to anybody, don't be put off by what I'm saying. Don't be put off by mm -hmm. it. I say it out of care. Yeah. I say it out of care for the discipline and care for the fact that we may really need you and this could save you some time. Mm. You know, and, and one, one of the things I'll just say in finishing is people think, well, storytelling and myth, it's too big. I haven't had any of that. I haven't had enough. I, I'm not inflated enough to be able to do that. But, you know, Coleman Barks translation of Rumi I never forget these lines. If you haven't been fed, become bread. If you haven't <laughs> been fed, become bread. You will be blessed by the stories when you run, let them rumble around in your jaw. They, as Rumi says again, they die of cold on the page. So you have to learn these things by heart. 
bring them into the sound house of your own body and something unexpected may happen. Mm. I love what you're saying. And um, it's something that I've been coming around to after kind of going through a couple stages of my journey as being a more public person, having written a couple books and having this podcast and, you know, doing some traveling to do teaching and things. Where I've come to now is recognizing the just how good it is to be rooted in a place and to be serving a community that hopefully later then I can be served by or supported by, you know, when I'm too old to teach yoga classes or something. And I think one of the things that we're conditioned to in this day and age, it's like we're all enchanted by social media to some extent. And I felt this myself is this kind of pressure to be a international teacher, you know, to have this like big scope to have the flashy website to be doing all of these online events and uh, getting more reach. But I've really, um, you know, even before the pandemic, I'd come to this this feeling like I just want to be a community teacher. Like I want to be of use in a, in a real community. Cause that's actually where I get the nourishment, you know, having done, you know, a world tour and done some traveling with teaching, I realized like at the end of the day, you know, everyone's left satisfied. I'm there in an empty room by myself with the paper cups and you know, clean, putting all my gear in a gym bag, you know, and that wasn't really satisfying. Um, so I feel what you're saying. I, I hope that people hearing this, that some of it enters them and starts to work on them. Just disenchanting yourself of the idea that you have to be an international, a global teacher, someone with this great reach and range. What is, what is ticking, usually ticking under that desire, is just a hysterical desire to be witnessed. And I wouldn't take that too seriously. And I also wouldn't be too hard on oneself for going through that because the fans of that infant infantilism gets blown on us from all quarters of modern life. That's what we think success is. Mm -hmm. But that is, they're just, you know, occasionally you do get uh, a teacher and that's the way they're their their life is going to go but what i really want to emphasize is as soon as you are telling a story to a few people around a fire it's already a victory yeah you already won man you're already yeah. you're already part of this incredible thing and it doesn't have to be as my friend danny deardorff used to say stretched on the rack of infinite progress <laughs> that's that's really what is going on it's it's power stuff it's yeah. unmetabolized childish power stuff and your desire to work more intimately more locally is a sign of tremendous personal health and to be listened to it's what the christians call the still small voice that's what it is it has um accountability attached to it Mm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And that's something too. having um, witnessed, you know, traveling shaman and traveling yoga teachers kind of creating trouble wherever they go. One of the things that I tell people is that the reason they get away with that is because they're not embedded in a community. And it's the community that keeps you in line. Um, you know, in a community, if the shaman starts to act up, he's going to lose all his business or he's going to be kicked out to the forest again, you know. So I think there's like a, a benefit on like many levels to staying local, you know, just personally for me, I, I get so much more nourishment when I'm like truly connecting with people who I'll see at the, the grocery store or out on the walking path or something. There's just something about that more intimate relatedness, more down to earth relatedness, more uh, less persona, more presence that is incredibly nourishing to me. And, and I realized, you know, having tried other things, other ways, following the examples of some of my teachers that I'm just not built for it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I, one of the, you know, one of the great things, as I said, because this has become a, a theme in the chat, one of the great things around Bly and the men's work was once you're really in there, you realize that there's a lot 
of wisdom not on the stage it's in the audience totally yeah and the the these, these, are, these are guys who are maybe quieter they have a different type of charisma but they they're the ones that turn around and say well i have this small press and you know what last year i got my book out and we sold a thousand copies and and it's it's locally centered and it's really wonderful and uh, these are men in their 60s and they've been doing this a long time it doesn't have to be it it the seduction the seduction of the stage lights the seduction of the microphone uh, i have been as guilty and as susceptible to that as anybody else let me assure you but it's not relevant to me now mm. Yeah, I, I mean, you're a musician too. And I feel I always felt like, well, maybe I'm able to get on the bigger stages and feel totally comfortable there because I was also able to get on a stage when I was 14 at the local blues club and get up on uh, to do a jam session or something like there's something about me that does love to be in the heat of uh, performance. Um, you know, it really puts me in the moment and things come through that it's really hard to tap into otherwise. But it's not for everyone. And I don't think that should be the aspiration for everyone, like to set the bar at this level where you should have a certain amount of followers and you should be traveling the world to teach. It's not good for the, the human being, but it's also not good for the planet either. No, no, you know, and I go, yes, I did that already. I've had that experience. I've literally done everything that I wanted to do. And then suddenly you're, you're aware in the classic kind of midlife crisis of like, good God, it is possible with health and modern medicine, I could live for, an, I could still live for a really long time, but I want to get something. Uh, it is the core of all true spiritual practice that in the end you have to serve something that is greater than your own ends your own ends will not in the end make you totally happy what makes you happy or even give you just a, a, a greater sense of sustenance is being part of uh, as kabir the poet says believe in the great to believe in the great sound you you've got to understand or a w e one of the things i argue for in smoke hole is we've forgotten our sense of shame. We're so terrified of the word shame as if it's always a negative, but shame is important to me on occasion. I don't want to be possessed by it, but I want to have it as an identifying emotion when I've deeply betrayed what I should stand for. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely shame uh, helps with some self-correction as long as you don't get pulled down into the depths and held there by shame, right? But on the other end too, you said something about this in Courting the Wild Twin um, that I really appreciated that is counter to what I'm hearing out in the mainstream about vulnerability. And you admit that you don't think vulnerability is always appropriate. And I said, hallelujah to that. Cause I also feel that, that it's not some great aspiration to always be vulnerable uh, because well, sometimes, no. yeah, and go ahead. It's a seduction technique. Mm, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of guys of my age and younger, vulnerability ticks a lot of um, a lot of scorecards for like, hey, he's, he's so open, da da da. In other words, actually, this little shit doesn't really stand for anything. That's actually what's going on. And they've they've learnt to they've learnt, you know, tears are always near, teaching moments are always near, vulnerability <laughs> is always near. And they don't have a shred of self-reliance. Well, then there's also something there about a lack of healthy boundaries too. And yeah, do you really want to get um, drawn into their gooey mess of a life? Probably not. No, you know, um, I've written a lot about longing and I've, I'm interested in the currency of longing, but you can't build and frame a life entirely around it. Um, in Greek myth, you have Psyche and Eros. Psyche, you know, the word psyche is the soul. Eros is fun, it's that great spark of life force. Hmm. Now, if you have too much eros, you burn out. If you have too much psyche, 
you just go round and round in deep, deep circles, having one meaningful conversation after another, but you certainly are ill-equipped to pay your rent. No. Now, I know lots and lots of people in either of those camps, but the alchemical move, the third move, is to live in the sweet spot between Psyche and Eros. And that's what the alchemic alchemists are trying to get to with the heavenly wedding and this, that, and the other. But it's always look to the opposite. You know, um, where, where you're lacking is usually the thing, you know, you're really not paying attention to. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, you bring up, uh, you brought up Greek myth a couple times and, you know, myself being interested in Jung and his ideas and then all the post Jungians down the line, um, a lot of them uphold the study of Greek mythology. You know, this is one of the things I think Jung himself said it was essential to understanding his work. And Hillman also said, you know, if you're interested in Western culture, where you come from, you got to study Greek myth. But I know for myself, like I'm a non-academic person. I never went to university, right? And anytime I've tried to read translations of Greek myths or old stories like Beowulf, they just, they, I can't absorb them. There's just nothing goes in. And uh, I find that for myself, I need to get like somebody who's a good teller of that story, who tells it in maybe an updated way or in their own way. Um, you know, so like Madeline Miller, the Kirke, and um, I think it's called Song of Achilles. Those books really like lit me up because they're written more like novels and I could just get lost in the characters or and then your book, too, I think really hit home for me as being able to do that. So what do you think, like um, people who are wanting to bring more myth and storytelling, more of that richness into their lives? What's a good place for them to start besides, of course, your own books? Well, um... I, again, as, as a father, I, I have a child who's really had the Greek world opened up by Madeline Miller. Mm. Uh, and I've worked with Madeline Miller, you know, oh, cool. she's just a terrific figure and erudite and talented and a great writer, but also just in really in love with those stories and is doing really significant things. So to, to ape what you've already said, which is really find someone that tells Beowulf lean to the oral not the written mm. do you remember what i said Rumi? you'll die they'll die of cold on the page what you're experiencing probably is you know rather anemic theory addled translations and that leaves a bad taste in your mouth it's funny my the reason why the greek thing is so embedded in jung and is so incredibly popular is it is an extraordinary medium in which to understand how human beings tick. So if you asked a Greek person, like Christ, people, they, they, you know, people, evangelicals saying, do you, like, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? It's a belief, it's a big thing. In Greek culture, if you have an erection, Aphrodite is present in the room. It's <laughs> right. not a concept. It's not something that you have to, uh, think about it. it happens it happens when you make love it, it so you know when you are when someone a man is struck dead with a heart attack everybody knows it was the arrow of Apollo that did it because Apollo handles heart attacks that's how he does it so you're living in this animate world what's that word they use personifications mm -hmm. One of the weird things about Christianity, because people are always trying to make out that Dionysus and Christ are the same. They ain't. They ain't. No. And, uh, and Christianity turns a lot of Greek myth on its head by being resolutely unheroic in, in a Greek way of looking at things. It's not a, Christ is not a Zeusian figure. He's saying you're going to have to carry a cross on your back. It's utterly different. It turns everything on its head. But the Greek world is so compelling because Jung believed brilliantly, uh, or Jung would say, the gods are these divine influxes that move through us disguised as turns in our personality. 
and they're bigger than us. And if we don't understand them through stories, they become possession states. When I was a younger man, I had a trouble with my temper. And one of the ways I've learned to handle that is through reading about Hercules or reading about that kind of thing. And finding story is a, is a medium in which to approach the weather patterns of these old spirits. But my area is not Greek. My area is where I come from. It says Irish, Scottish, British stories. I've just been um, over lockdown. I have just compiled an anthology of the writings, sort of selected writings of the Irish philosopher John Moriarty. Hmm. And Moriarty is a figure you're going to hear more about in the next year or so, if I have anything to do with it. Yeah. And look, the Celtic world is far more porous than the Greek. It doesn't have this kind of Olympian set, slightly franchised Hollywood feeling about it. Um, there are moments where the tale is being told by a crow or a stretch of river. In a way, Irish myth never quite escapes the Stone Age. Mm. There's more shaman than senate in it. Oh, man, you touched on something that, yeah, again, like you, it, it stirs something visceral in me. That I've never really thought about before, but there is something to me about Greek myth. Like to me, it's like a feeling of like cold white marble or something. And um, when you're talking about the, the like even the fairy tales, like courting the wild twin, there's like an earthiness to it that for me goes beyond culture. And that's what's like really getting into getting under my skin, you know, and so I need that kind of like earthiness, the the more primal, um, you know, I don't know, I would say the more soulful rather than the spiritual or the academic. I I know I know what you're getting at. I would just just to say that sense of, of the porcelain that you get within or the marble within Greek myth is is a it's a it's it's illusionary. Sure. Yeah. You know, you get you get to a figure like Dionysus and writhing around Dionysus's body are hundreds of thousands of little goddesses of rivers and mountains and lightning storms and raisins and baboons and there's all this other stuff going on it's a very polytheistic world and again that's the you know the huge difference when christianity emerges jesus says no this is how we roll whereas the greek thing is there's you can roll in in any number of ways it isn't it isn't centered in in that fashion but i would recommend you know if you're interested in a different Celtic myth does something really different to Greek. And for me, it tells us more about the world that was there before, again, that big word, the Senate. Before, before we really, you know, the, the first myth makes this enormous jump with Sumerian and Greek culture, where finally things start to get written down. And once things get written down, there can be a little bit of an agenda to them. There can be a certain element of rhetoric and persuasion to them. But there are other stories, and the ones that I really love, where the polemics seem to come across species. Mm, yeah. And as I talked to you, Brian, after a you know, quarter of a century of doing this and being around the, all these wonderful figures who we've been enjoying and I've been, I hope, honouring, in the end that's the place where I am. This conversation between species as the world is on fire. Mm. Okay, I think we've got to stop because there's just so much to absorb there, you know? And one of the things that has been echoing throughout our conversation is this idea of embracing the authenticity of my incompleteness. You know, and, and a lot of what we were talking about is, you know, this enchantment by social media and what we're aspiring to be and to be a world teacher, you got to kind of be finished and have it all figured out. And then you're locking yourself from development. So I love this as like a central theme, just embracing the authenticity of your incompleteness. 
it sounds down like downright radical in the current day and age, but I love it. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad because I mean I know, you know, uh, I'm a visible figure, and uh, people may assume that I'm sort of you know perpet perpetually on social media or the rest. It looks like I have other people that do that work, kind work for me, so I can sort of you know keep going, but. I would suggest to everybody, you know, drop the nonsense, drop the nonsense, but be gentle with yourself in the doing of it. Um, look at your life truthfully. Don't get rid of the hard parts uh, and dig into that prayer mat. Hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. I, I gotta ask you one thing before we go. So in courting the wild twin, use repetition of word a lot and i get that it has like kind of an incantery of effect right but at one point in the story you say or the character says or the narrator says albatross 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 mary celeste i think is the name and it seems like a non sequitur and i'm like what's that about is it a disruptor is it meant to evoke something <laughs> i can't remember <laughs> I uh, it would have been what it would have been it's back to my big thing about oral thought in other words as i'm writing i'm talking out loud a lot of the time and so if what i write is what i can see in my mind at that moment and the thing in my storytelling that i'm most interested in anybody that goes to see me they may not like it but the one thing they will not tell you is Oh, it's like a recital. It's not ever like a recital. I imagine it over and over and over again as if it's the first time because it is the first time. So when I said albatross, 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 of course, then I was thinking about the boat, the Marie Celeste, you know, and that whole, you're familiar with this, I take it. No. Oh, okay. So the answer to your question is, <laughs> is on Google. Uh, you know, great God, Google. Have a look at the Mary Celeste and uh, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, uh, various stuff like that. And that would have been it. And it's the kind of thing that usually a good editor tries to get rid of immediately because they'll say that's a moment where that person will drop out of the story. Yeah. But it, to me, it's like, no, that's how I roll. And that's you, know, you either like it or you don't. Well, you know, if I wasn't talking to you today, I would have probably Googled it at some point because the curiosity would have been eating away at me. And I love too, like they either would have taken it out or they would have put in a footnote. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not certainly I'll finish with this. There are two strands to my work. One is pastoral and one is prophetic. The pastoral strand understands that culturally we're about 14 years old <laughs> and we need quite a few handrails and we need sometimes to be told what time it is. We need to be encouraged. We need to gain confidence and books like smoke hole, which walk you through the story. Like I'm your walking companion, a pastoral books and they're important, but I also write prophetic books like the one where I went out into the woods for 120, uh, 101 days. That's a different thing. They're not there. They're there to do a different type of work. Mm -hmm. They're there to startle. They're not there to reassure. And those books live at the very edge of my understanding. And I would never describe myself as a master storyteller or a this or a that, but I am an artist interested in the imagination. And those two roads of pastoral and prophetic seem to be what my work is about. Mm. That's great. Well, I'm going to tell people where they can go when they want to find out more about you. And I'm going to recommend that, um, that people actually buy the hard copy of your books. We didn't get into this here. I did want to ask you about your art making, but your beautiful illustrations are sprinkled throughout the book. Um, this is Courting the Wild Twin. I'm getting smoke hole because it looks like it's of the same quality and as a you know, a book lover, actual physical book lover, I was so happy to get this in the mail and feel it and see its size. And it's just, 
I love it. So um, people will go to your website, find out more. Anything coming up in the next month or so? Anything you're doing online around storytelling or teaching? I have um, I have an, an online course. It's all pre-recorded that I made with a amazing filmmaker called Bobby Bailey. Uh, and if you put in, you know, Martin Shaw, Dr. Martin Shaw, maybe storyteller online course, you'll go straight there. For anybody that's interested in this and wants to go further, it's a really good resource. I'm beginning to teach again in England. Uh, go to schoolofmyth.com or systemistica.com, which is my small press, and you'll very quickly get to find out what's going on. Great. Oh, here we go. There's a little footnote that I got to ask you about. Any great uh, emigration stories that you could point us toward? You don't have to get into anything, but anything that comes to mind that we can then check out? No, I, I think at this point, I probably, I probably, uh, I mean, this, a story that I think of a lot at the moment is not a story necessarily of migration, but it's a story a lot of us have a feeling for. It's the Odyssey. Yeah. And if you don't know the story of the Odyssey, it's the end of a terrible war and Odysseus and a small group of men are simply trying to get home. And they're trying to get back to a very undramatic Greek island called Ithaca. And no one really knows. On the journey, Odysseus gets offered every single wonder under the sun. But he says, I want to get back to the rocky crags of Ithaca. I want to get back to my dear wife. I want to get back to my son. I want to get back to my smallness. And he has to go through hell. And interestingly, if you really know the story of Odysseus, in the end, he only comes back as a nobody. Uh, he actually is disguised by uh, he's disguised by Athena and comes back in disguise as, as a as less than nothing, but he begins as a somebody. But the reason I'm telling you this story to go and read again is because in Greek myth there are two kind of traditions in epic. One is the type you get with the Iliad, where it's all about warfare and grandeur and what they call uh, they call you know imperishable glory kleos but the second branch which is the odyssey is called nostos and nostos is the longing for the deep home you barely have the words for in welsh they call it hiraeth uh, a christian would probably call it eden and somewhere in all of this madness that the world is under at the moment, there's a, a nostos growing in people. And I suggest attend to it. Dr. Martin Shaw, thank you so much. I feel like I could just you know, sit around the fire with you all day long. So I appreciate you taking all the time and uh, take care. Okay, man. <laughs> Hello. Hello.